everybody to today's webinar. We're thrilled to have you all with us. Um, the topic of today's webinar is supporting employment and education for people with psychosis challenges with Rona Unger, who's probably a familiar face to a lot of you if you've been involved in ISPS US for a while or if you've attended any of our webinars. I'm Leah Giorgini, and if you haven't seen me yet, I'm Executive Director of ISPS US, been in position since March, and I'm really interested and passionate about this topic. Not only was I a young person, um, and my first episode of psychosis definitely interrupted my education, but I later went in to work as an occupational therapist and did some vocational rehabilitation work myself with folks. Um, so I'm thrilled that Ron is bringing his very um, holistic perspective to this topic. Um, and let me introduce him to you if you don't know him already. So Ron Unger is a therapist and educator specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis, uh, a facilitator for the Hearing Voices Group and a supervisor for a peer specialist team. His work is informed by personal and family experiences of psychosis. As I've said, he chairs the Education Committee of ISPS US and blogs at recoveryfrompsychosis.org. I'm sure he'll introduce himself further. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Ron. Well, welcome everybody. I, yeah, a lot of the ideas I'll be talking about today come from my background in cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis and also from the Hearing Voices Network, which has developed a lot of ideas and shared them around the world. Um, and these are things that I think um, people can find helpful, even if they aren't trained as a therapist or um and that, that sort of thing has been found um, that ideas, for example, from CBT can be used by non-therapists, uh, especially the ones that I'll be talking about today. Um, and I know that a lot of you here already are kind of like trained as employment sp specialists, supportive employment specialists. And um, I'm not actually trained in that. I'm trained as a therapist. But I, of course, supporting people on employment is also part of what therapists do. So um, whether you work as a specialist or, or not, I think knowing something about how to support employment is important. And then I, I, the way this talk came about is I was invited by a bunch of supported employment and education specialists to give a talk about psychosis in particular, because often those specialists found that working with people with psychosis was harder or they got more confused doing it than they did with people with other kinds of mental health challenges. And the talk was well received. So I thought, why not offer it to a wider audience? Um, yeah. So, you know, to get started, we might talk about like, well, what is, you know, why support employment and education? And the key thing is just helping people move towards the life they want. And there's this idea that moving towards a desired life is more effective than trying to reduce symptoms anyway. Um, because sometimes, for example, what is a symptom um, changes as once somebody finds that they can move their life forward while hearing a voice, for example, they might not even care that they're hearing a voice anymore. The main thing is to get their life moving in a way that makes sense. Um, and supportive employment, as of course all of you who work in the field know, it's an evidence-based approach. You know, like you know, there's dozens of studies that can show that that's true. Um, for those of you who don't know, I want to make a distinction between supportive employment and the earlier idea of a sheltered work environment. Because a sheltered work environment is about let's modify the workplace so that um, you know people with a mental health challenge can can work there um but supported employment is more like well let's support the person so they can just go work in an everyday work environment um and and, and so it's not like a special sheltered thing though i do think there's you know some arguments can be made for trying to you know encourage people to modify a workplace to make it a little more friendly towards people that that may have a few challenges. And we'll talk about that in terms of schools and education in a little bit. Um, so the key thing, I, I took this slide from somebody who spoke at our recent ISPS US conference that happened in Sacramento. 
But Jennifer Gerlach had this as part of her presentation, and it's about her own experience. And she wrote that some of the most helpful things that treatment providers did for her were helping her apply to college and just talking about the future, like she was just any other kid. And at the time, she imagined a life as a therapist and speaker and writer, and and it's come true. <laughs> She's been free of the hospital, as she said, for 18 years and counting. So this stuff is just really important. It can be the most crucial thing that happens to somebody. Um, and again, it's, a lot of it is just the normal thing. Hey, this person may have some troubles with psychosis, but what about their future? <laughs> what, what do they want for themselves? Just help them move forward. And that might be the most important thing you can do. Um, well, let's step back and, and think about you know, what is psychosis? And um, one kind of like quick definition is that it's a some combination of being, you know, especially disorganized and being out of touch with reality. So that brings up a question. How many of you are completely organized and completely in touch with reality? I encourage you, if you are, just type I am into the chat. Um, yeah, if you're completely organized and completely in touch with reality. Um, yeah, I'm not, not seeing people make that claim. Um, <laughs> so, so, sometimes, um, if, if anybody does make the claim, I just say, well, there's a, somebody with a grandiose delusion. Um, but one idea from, a key idea, I think, from CBT for psychosis is that it's psychosis is on a continuum with normal human difficulties. It's just when they get too severe, we draw a line and say, that's psychotic. Um, that's why some use the term extreme states instead of psychosis. It conveys this idea that it's about extreme versions of states of mind and reactions to problems that are common to humanity. So a few important things to realize. Um, one is that there's many ways to be what gets called psychotic, and some ways are more severe than others. Um, and also people move along a continuum over time, including to where they recover and are no longer what you could call psychotic any, at, at all. Um, for example, I know a lot of very competent professional people who were once diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, interestingly, research shows that people are much more likely to recover in parts of the world where they don't receive that much psychiatry. And some reason, one, one reason that people think that is true is that these are often areas where you know, the, the community needs everybody to pitch in and, and, and work. So instead of thinking people can't work, they're more likely to say, well, what kind of work can this person do? And then get, help them get busy doing that. And later the person might recover and become able to do much more. But just the process of getting engaged and involved is helpful. And something like that happened to this guy I know. His name is Ron Bassman. He's public about his story, so I can share it. But he had a second psychotic episode after he'd already gone to work in a mental hospital as a psychologist. And now once he was no longer so psychotic, he tried to go back, back to work, but he found he wasn't mentally able to do his regular job. Now, fortunately, instead of firing him, they just figured out, well, what kind of stuff can he do? And got him busy doing that. And, you know, so he got busy doing that. And then after a while, was able to do more. And then he went back to his regular job and then he advanced and later he was head of a mental health agency and later directed a nonprofit and all this sort of thing. So in, in, in doing supportive employment, you can help people move along this continuum towards recovery and being in charge of their lives. And just holding the hope that they can possibly do that is, is, is one important intervention, just holding that hope. Um, so one of the um, key ideas in CBT for psychosis is something called normalizing. And, um, and it's very related to this, this idea that psychosis is just on a continuum with normal states of mind. Um, and just where things get a little more extreme. Now you might think, well, not everybody has paranoia and delusions, um, but, 
it's it's helpful to, to question that. So I'm encouraging you to fill out this poll, this poll quickly. Um, so if you could just check off, want to see where people are at on it. Uh, at least get to work more than half of them. All right, I didn't see, everybody hadn't had a chance to answer, but I'll go on. Just as you can see, um, there's a lot of people that had um, a lot of these experiences. And, um, and just something like feeling your phone vibrate when it's actually not vibrating is a tactile hallucination, <laughs> to use the, 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 that technical term, as it were. Um, and, you know, we all sometimes have um, mistaken beliefs. We get suspicious or paranoid. Um, you know, like when you get some of these texts or emails that want your login information, a little paranoia is actually kind of helpful. Um, so, you know, you might not have had experiences that are extreme enough that somebody might call them psychosis, but just you know, talking to people, when we talk to people about our own weird experiences or paranoid thoughts or whatever, it can help people see themselves that the stuff is human. And, and then they have more hope for themselves. They might have got a little carried away with something, but they can tone it down and, and join, you know, join the rest of humanity. Um, and, and, and also normalizing, part of it is noticing how common a lot of the experiences associated with psychosis are like hearing voices, you know, research has shown that maybe about 10% of people will at some point in their life experience a significant episode of, of voice hearing. Um, and, and many of those will get through it without any needing any kind of mental health assistance. Um, also, it can help to see how even something that looks kind of like a kind of bizarre psychotic concern might have its root in just really normal human concerns. So maybe the person is sometimes believing that their coworkers are plotting about how to do them in. Now, if we consider this, well, at its root, this might be about feeling insecure and unsure about how to relate to their coworkers, which is really common, especially when people have been isolated or have had past trauma. As many people with psychosis have had past trauma. Then we might not be as intimidated about how to work with it, and we might end up being more effective. Um, now, I want to just show a short video that was produced by people in the, the hearing voices movement, basically. Um, and um, it's just about um, the experience of hearing voices and how it's and how to support people in the education system who do hear voices and see if you can't see in this some some kind of like normalizing kind of stuff being discussed. And also you'll see in the, in the earlier part of it, you'll see some people doing what we might call abnormalizing, which tends not to be helpful, making people feel they're more abnormal. Students like us who hear voices or see visions are, like any other student, full of potential. And some of our skills can come from our experiences of hearing or seeing things. Like me, I can think outside the box and I know we can't take things at face value. I'm great with focusing and multitasking. I've heard voices for a long time and I've had to ignore them in order to study. And even when we're struggling, it's important to keep in mind that our abilities enabled us to get a place at university in the first place. For some of us, our voices can also be a positive force in our lives. The reasonable adjustments and support that you offer can help us overcome these challenges and complete our course. So in my case, I can find it quite difficult navigating university life alongside my voices. They can make me feel terrible. Everyone's looking at you here. 
You're so stupid. We're now going to look at sensory perceptions and focus on an example of auditory hallucinations in patients with schizophrenia. They're all looking at you. You're so dumb. You're so stupid. They're all laughing at you. They're all laughing at you. It's difficult enough without having to deal with the stigma from other people. I've also had some tough experiences recently. Ha <laughs> ha! You can't even call people on the phone. You're so useless. You are pathetic. Attendance levels are unacceptable. If they don't improve, there will be sanctions. Alex has failed to inform me of any mitigating circumstances. I think you need to suspend your studies. If you're hearing voices, you just can't be well enough. I can manage my voices when I am fully supported. Can I try? I don't like your tone. You are sounding very aggressive. Exam situations are the worst for me. OK, you have three hours for this exam and your time begins now. All of these responses can be really unhelpful. They not only feed into stigma around our experiences, but also create extra barriers for us to navigate when systems and institutions can already feel intimidating or exclusionary. Sometimes systemic changes are needed, but often it can be the simple or everyday things that you, as university staff, can do that will really help us. Sensing things that others can't is a common human experience. How many of you have heard someone call your name when no one did? Or felt a bug crawling on your skin when nothing was there? We're all sensory beings, but some people have sensory experiences they find overwhelming or distressing. We'll share some resources about this on the student platform. How are you feeling today? Just checking in as I haven't seen you at lectures or seminars in a while. It would be great if we could arrange a one-to-one -one chat to see how we can support you. Sure, a break from studies is one option, but you can also try blended learning or get support from the counselling service, the students union or disability services. How can we help? What do you need from us? In today's exam, you'll be permitted extra time and we've built in some breaks for you. There are lots of ways to understand hearing voices. Try to be kind instead of fearing us and talk to us about them. Many of us have experiences of being dismissed, misunderstood and marginalised. Try to believe and respect us and we can figure out together how to thrive at uni. If we fall off the radar, please don't let us fall through the cracks. We have so much to offer, but sometimes we just need the chance to show it. For more information, please visit www.voicecollective.co.uk. Right. So, um, so yeah, so that hopefully gives you some ideas about how some people that hear voices think they, um, what kind of perspectives and approaches might be, be helpful and it's important to think about. Um, so, um, one thing I think that's helpful to think about is that, you know, like I, I said earlier, I think psychosis covers a broad range of experiences. Um, and it's important to individualize what you're doing to the person you're working with. Um, and collaborating on, you know, like focusing on problems that they also see as problems. Because, you know, it's really important not to decide what someone's problem is and jump in and try to fix it, but be working on things together. 